Good morning. My name is uh, Nico Safos, and I'm a senior fellow here at the Energy and National Security Program. And I'm uh, very excited uh, that we have Eric Varnes here today from Equinor uh, to share the company's energy perspectives 2018. Um, you know, my background is in consulting, so I spent a lot of my career doing forecasts, you know, long term, short term, energy, gas, pipeline, LNG. And there's a few things you learn when you do a lot of forecasts. One is you tend to be wrong a lot. <laughs> the second is that you still got to do it. But the most important thing you learn is that it's a lot easier to poke fun at someone else's forecast than it is to do your own. Kind of sit back and say, what about blockchain? You know, what about autonomous vehicles? And have someone else try to figure out the answer. Um, and so as a result of that, I have a lot of respect and admiration for, for people and for organizations that do uh, do the work and try to figure out the answer to these questions and try to make trade-offs and try to, you know, put some numbers behind different different outlooks and scenarios. And so I'm very excited um, for this uh, for this conversation. Um, before I invite Eric up here to to talk, um, just a very brief uh, safety uh, notice. Uh, we're not expecting anything, uh, but if we uh, do hear uh, an alarm, um, look to. Uh, the CSIS staff in the back and up here uh, to guide you and we'll make our way out of this exit and also uh, right behind you as you as you came in. But we're not expecting anything, so if you do hear it, just uh, let's calmly get out of here following the lead of the CSIS folks. Uh, and so with that, we're going to have uh, Eric do the presentation and then I'm going to ask him some questions and then we're going to open it up to the audience for Q&A. So thank you so much, Eric. Thank you and good morning. Thanks for the introduction. It's nice to be back at the CSIS and this year with our eighth Energy Perspectives publication and outlook. Uh, and you're right, it's difficult to make forecasts, uh, <laughs> not only for tomorrow, but, uh, but at least for 2050 as well. And that's, but we have to do it and then we're in a long-term business. Uh, Equinor is uh, the company that was formerly called Statoil, so we're in a long-term oil and gas and renewable energy business. And uh, therefore, it's required that we make up our minds about where the energy world might be going over the next decades. It's uh, part of our DNA, if you like. So uh, my name is Erik Vannes. I head up uh, the macroeconomics and market analysis team in Equinor. I serve as the company's chief economist, and I'm also head of strategy in our mid and downstream business. And as part of that responsibility, I'm, I head up the work on that leads to, to our energy perspectives, which is our attempt at competing with the likes of uh, IEA and Shell and BP and ExxonMobil in, in, uh, in trying, to, trying to have a fact-based discussion on where the energy world might be going depending on, on the assumptions we, we apply. And when we do that, we, the first thing we, we have to think about is, uh, is that um, most of the answers to all of the challenges that we have in terms of energy, and in particular in terms of sustainability, you will find those in Asia. And the things that happen in Asia will determine whether we reach climate targets or not. Uh, that's where the energy demand is growing. That's where the economic growth is the largest. That's where more than half the global population live less than 4,000 kilometers from Hong Kong. And as a consequence of that, we tend to have a picture of something in Asia on the front page of the report. So also this year. This is an illustration of goods transportation, oil and LNG, LNG transportation back and forth from Asia, generally passing through the Strait of Malacca. And that's what this year's, uh, this year's front page shows. I'll see if I get this to work. There we go. Uh, when we think about where the global energy markets and uh, the energy system and the energy mix might be moving over the next decades, the answer to that question depends very much which window we choose to look out of. Uh, on the one hand, you can become very optimistic in terms of getting CO2 emissions down when you take into account things like record number of electric vehicles being put on the road, cost reductions in that part of the light duty vehicle segment uh, being very substantial. One million new cars were put on the road last year that are electric, roughly half of those in China. We passed three million in total. We passed four million in total during the summer, so it's, expon it's growing expon exponentially serves as a basis for optimism. At the same time, 79 million new cars were put on the road in 2017 running on a combustion engine. Same number as in 2016, so the electric vehicles only take the growth in the new car fleet. 
but it will speed up. We think it, they might be competitive within the next five to ten years with with the combustion engine uh, um, vehicles without subsidies. So there is a there's a signal of a potential change there that might be really significant. At the same time, also renewable uh, electricity uh, from solar and wind panels record investments last year, 167 gigawatts of total capacity put on the ground. The costs are coming down. There are, they are competitive at the margin now with gas and coal-fired electricity, in, at least in, in, in industrial economies. Uh, gives reason to believe that, they will con that that capacity will continue to grow with double-digit growth rates for a while until it, be until it becomes so big that the double-digit growth rates are basically impossible, but it, will, but it will continue to grow in all kinds of scenarios. Uh, on the other hand, CO2 emissions started to rise again, global CO2 emissions. So if you look out another window, you become a pessimist. We had three years of flat CO2 emissions. Some people thought we had actually bent the curve, not so. 2018, we will have higher emissions again than last year. One of the reasons, of course, increased oil demand. 1.7 million barrels per day of increase in oil demand last year. The energy content of 1.7 million barrels of oil is three times the amount of electricity we potentially can produce from those record number of windmills and solar panels. So it serves to show a little bit of the scale of the challenge. Uh, when you look at the geopolitical situation, the, both regionally and the global geopolitical situation, everything that has happened since the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015 goes in the wrong direction. Hardly anything has happened in terms of putting measures behind targets and actually trying to move us towards climate targets. Uh, the co level of conflict has increased. We have sanctions against Russia, against Iran. We, now we have increased protectionism between China and the United States and other parts of the world, uh, lowering our possibilities of technolo technological change that would move us in the right direction. Lowering an ec economic growth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, reducing the probability that global politicians together could act to solve which is one of our biggest collective problems that we've ever faced as, huma uh, as human beings. And that, that's uh, solving the climate change issue. And it's an enormous collective effort that's necessary. And therefore, having a political climate where that is difficult and where other legitimate political concerns determine the agenda makes it more difficult than many people hoped for after November 2015. So depending on what, what, what of these trends and other trends we assign weight to, you can draw very different pictures of the future of energy different stories, different scenarios, and that's what we have to do. So we don't only forecast one scenario, we, we actually make three. Whoops, sorry. So we made three scenarios. On the, where, we where we use these different changes, we employ them as assumptions, we assign different weights to some of them, and there, then we can write very, very different stories about where the world will be in 2050 in terms of energy demand and energy mix. The reform scenario is the central one. There we assume that all national contributions, national pledges, promises in the, in, the, in the Paris Agreement will be fulfilled, will be delivered upon by 2030. That's not a walk in the park for many countries. It's relatively easy for some countries. If that happens, we're, energy intensity will go down, CO2 emission intensity will go down, energy demand will grow, energy, we will be much more energy efficient than we have been historically, so energy demand will not follow GDP growth, but it's not sufficient. We will hardly budge CO2 emissions from the energy sector in the reform case. So much more is needed in terms of energy and climate policies than what is indicated by the, by the, the nationally determined contributions and an expectation that those will further be tightened after 2030. We need more. There's an urgent need for, for action, if you like, which is, which is what we said when we, did, we presented this report and which, what, which is what was the message in the IPCC report a couple of days back. Therefore, we have also made a renewal scenario. We cannot exclude the possibility that we are actually able to deliver on climate targets. In that renewal scenario, we assume that will happen. That's a scenario where we take energy-related CO2 emissions down to the necessary level to be consistent with the two-degree target with a slightly higher than 50% probability. And then we calculate the way back. That way back is not a walk in the park. It's an enormously challenging change, and I'll come back to what that requires. And then on uh, the rivalry scenario, which uh, is a relatively unique scenario, if I may say so, uh, that's a scenario where we, where we dare to model the potential consequences of continued geopolitical volatility, geopolitical conflict, regional conflicts, continued 
unrest in the Middle East. Uh, periods of protectionism, periods of economic sanctions. So we have lower economic growth, but you have much less development of energy efficiency, and you have countries resorting to their own domestic indigenous sources of energy due to security of supply concerns, etc., etc. Therefore, we get too much coal demand, too much coal use, in particular in Asia, where the energy demand is growing and where the indigenous resource that they have in ample amounts is coal. Not as an area we would like to be in. Lower economic growth, higher emissions, but not something we can exclude. In all this uncertainty, there are a few things that we think are absolutely certain. Common beliefs about the future, irrespective of scenario. One of them is that the demand for goods and activities and services that require energy will go up. Require energy either in their production or in the consumption. Because we will be more people, two and a half billion more people on Earth by 2050. We will have economic growth. We will have higher purchasing power. Thereby, we will demand more of goods, activities, and services that require energy. For instance, travel. For instance, consumption goods. Whether total primary energy demand goes up depends on how energy efficient we can deliver those services and what types of sources of energy we're, we're using. So that's not a given, but what we think is given is that the underlying demand for energy will go up. We also think that the world is undergoing an energy transition. We see it in electric vehicles, we see it in renewables, but we don't see it many other places and we don't see it all over. So the speed of the transition is much too slow, the scope of the transition is much, much too narrow to deliver on the necessary changes. But that could change, and it will have to change if we are to reach climate targets. And the third belief, enormous investments are needed across the energy spectrum to deliver on the demand, to replace existing uh, production that declines, etc. And it's not only in renewable electricity with associated infrastructure, grid, backup, storage systems, etc., but also a very large need for investments in new supply of oil and gas. Even in a two-degree world, and I'll come back to that. So what about primary energy demand? How will that develop? Start out with GDP. In these three scenarios, we, have, we believe the, the global economy will continue to grow, driven by two and a half billion more people, more middle class consumers, more labor, more capital, more capital behind each job, more female participation in the workforce in some countries where that is still possible and much more technological progress, in particular when the emerging economies catch up with the richest economies, driving economic development in the scenarios on average varying between roughly 2% per year to 2.7% per year, ending in a GDP level in 2050, which is somewhere between twice and two and a half times larger than today. That's the starting point. That gives more purchasing power. <coughs> to what extent that then leads to higher energy demand depends on the energy efficiency development. And if you see the right chart there, that contains our assumptions on energy intensity development, the amount of energy you use per dollar of GDP. And in all these three scenarios, we assume that the world will become energy efficient more rapidly than what we've done historically, and significantly so in the renewal scenario. Over the last 25 years, if you look at the white dots, energy intensity has on average gone down by 0.9%. So if economic growth were 3%, energy demand grew by 2.1% per year. In the renewal scenario, if we are to deliver on the two degree target, one way of getting there is to triple the rate of energy intensity improvement. So that by with 2.8% improvement in energy intensity, global energy demand goes down by 0.1% per year so that the total primary energy demand in 2050 is 6% lower than today. If you think that's impossible, then I challenge everybody to come up with something that more likely or more plausibly brings us to the two degree target. It's, but it's a, an enormous change. And remember that this is the result of all the behavioral changes following from something becoming more energy, intense, uh, energy efficient. The tendency that we, have, we buy more when something becomes cheaper, when a combustion engine becomes more efficient, we have a tendency of buying a bigger car, particularly if our neighbor drives a Hummer and we, you know, we, I need a Hummer to survive a crash with him as well. And we compensate by using more electricity 
when the refrigerator becomes more efficient because we buy a bigger one and we use the old one as a beer cooler in the basement so we double our use of electricity in spite of something becoming more efficient. That's included in these numbers, that type of behavioral change. When something becomes more cheap, the Asians will travel more, et cetera, et cetera. But after that, we still have to become much more energy efficient. The two other scenarios also decouple GDP growth and energy demand to a large extent, but not completely. And therefore also do not deliver on the two degree target. On the energy transition, we'll see a significant growth in renewables. We'll see a much more rapid change in the energy mix over the next 35 years in all these three scenarios than we have seen historically. If you look at the, west, the, the left column there, look at the red sliver at the top. That's the result of the revolution we're observing in wind and solar electricity. That's the new renewables part of primary energy demand. It's 2%. Fossil fuels still constitute 80% of total primary energy demand, as it has for the last 50 years. It hardly changes. It changes a little bit within, between coal and gas and oil, but it still stays at 80%. Going forward, that's going to change, and it has to change. And this is a complex chart, but I have three key messages. The red is growing. New renewables will become a larger share and a significant share, but sufficiently so only in the renewal scenario. 20%, growing from 2 to 20% of total primary energy demand, if we are to deliver on the 2 degree target. One message. Second message, look at coal demand. If we are to reach the 2 degree target, one way of getting there, the most likely and possible way of getting there, is that we have to reduce coal demand by 75%. Half of global coal is used in China. If we don't do that, we either have to have massive amounts of carbon capture and storage, much more than we have, or we have to do something else. And then the third message, look at the right chart, we will become more electric. The right chart shows total final energy consumption and their electricity is an important carrier. When you listen to the climate debate, in particular in Europe, but generally also, it often sounds as if all energy use is electricity and it's only a matter of getting coal and to some extent gas out of the mix, replace that by renewables and we're home free. That's not the case because 80% of our energy use is not electricity. It's using molecules in different types of burning processes, etc., etc. And going forward, electri the electrification share of our total final energy consumption will grow and it will grow faster than it has done historically. Historically, it grows by two percentage points per decade. Now it goes to 35% in the renewal case. But it will, that means that still 65% of our energy use in a two degree scenario will not be electricity. It will be direct burning of something, nuclear, uh, um, no, sorry, not nuclear, but, but uh, biomass, oil, gas, and coal, even in a two degree scenario. And you can change that. You could increase that electricity share, but then that requires much more investments in new renewable electricity. And there's a balance there about what is most efficient and what is cheapest. CO2 emissions. This shows the energy-related CO2 emissions. The only scenario that delivers is the renewal scenario, and that's not because it's easy, but because it's by design. Right? The trajectory in the renewal scenario it's a 67% reduction in emissions. It's within the carbon budgets from the IPCC, and it delivers the two-degree target with slightly higher than 50% probability. The two other scenarios do not deliver. In spite of all these changes in the, in the energy mix, in spite of the growth in energy efficiency, in spite of the fact that we've, in the reform case, built in the Paris pledges, the promises, what, what countries actually have signed up to, doesn't, it's not enough. Much more is needed. If you look at what the renewal scenario takes, look at the per region changes that are necessary. The OECD countries, the industrial economies of the world, we will have to reduce our emissions by 80%. We do that in the renewal case, both in North America, in Europe, and in the OECD parts of Asia Pacific. Very, very challenging when you think about changing, in particular, transport. The things that we're working with in the industrial economies at the moment are the easy part of the CO2 reduction. That's about getting coal out of the electricity mix. 
It's when we start, in Norway, we're beyond that 100 years ago because all of our electricity is renewables, it's hydroelectricity. We are struggling with how to get the CO2 emissions down from the transport sector, which is, there is hope, at least on light duty vehicles, but just imagine when we have to do this big scale on transportation, etc. We have to get it down by 80%. China, China today has 30% of global energy related CO2 emissions. They will have to reduce their emissions by 67%. In an economy that grows somewhere between four and four and a half percent per year, that is still the manufacturing warehouse of the world, uh, and where there's still uh, energy poor parts of the population. If they manage that, it's an enormous achievement. And it's necessary. And then you can look at India. I don't know if this works, but no. But look at India, it's the dark maroon there. India is a very small country in economic terms, in energy terms, in emissions. Because they have, they're poor, they have 400 million people that do not have access to electricity, they have hundreds of millions that use extremely unsustainable but carbon neutral biomass for their cooking and heating, and as a consequence, an enormous pollution problem. India will going forward grow by seven to eight percent per year. It will be an eight, seven to eight times larger economy in 2050, could be the world's third largest economy. And they will have to deliver on that and reduce their CO2 emissions by 20%. We allow it to increase for a while and then it has to come down. If they achieve that, it's an absolutely fantastic achievement. And we should probably all, if we're concerned with global climate and delivering on sustainable development goals like giving people access to affordable and reliable energy, we should probably all focus our brains and money and technology together with the Indians and the Chinese to solve the problem there. Because it's the biggest challenge. So what about <coughs> the transition per sector? This is electricity. We see electricity growing in all scenarios. That's shown in the left chart. Significant growth in electricity generation because we will become more electric. And note that there's a new source of electricity demand. It's the green area. I hope it's green there, yes. That's transport. So electrification of transport will take off in all these scenarios to the extent that it becomes visible as a source of electricity demand. And of course, the consequence of that is that oil demand then is replaced, right? In the middle, we show where all the new electricity generation will have to come from. Generally, the, all the gross additions in all the scenarios will mostly be renewables. And new renewables and mostly solar panels and windmills. That's the pink parts here, a little bit more geothermal. The renewal scenario, the two degree scenario in the middle is also characterized by that the growth in new renewables have to become much bigger because we also have to phase out coal. So we have to reduce the coal electricity generation capacity. That's the negative component. There's actually also reduction in gas there, but the most part of it is Cool. And then the result to the right shows the shares of electricity coming, generation coming from different sources. And today, solar panels and windmills deliver 5% of global electricity, the pink part of the top in 2015. And if we are to reach the two degree target, solar panels and windmills will have to deliver half of global electricity. And that's taking into account most of the electricity will be used in the northern parts of the world from 30 degrees north and northwards to 60, cold, dark, and quiet for long parts of the winter. And we have to make sure that we have electricity on Easter morning when everybody boils their egg, right? So the seasonal challenge is bigger probably than the, than the daily intermittency when uncontrollable electricity price. And that's a growing challenge as the share of electricity become, from these sources become large. But 50% is necessary an enormous revolution. And then we have road transport. This is the other sector where we see the changes happening, not sufficiently rapidly yet. In particular, I came in from Houston yesterday. It doesn't go very fast there. I saw a couple of Teslas, and we'll have to see more. And it will take place, and the potential is there that within the next 10 years, electric vehicles might be competitive with combustion engine vehicles, and why buy anything else then? But look at the size of the change. 
On the left side, you have light-duty vehicles. That's 25% of global oil demand, roughly, 25 million barrels per day. If we are to go to the two-degree target, we think that 65% of all new vehicles will have to be electric by 2030 in 12 years. Today's one out of 80, 65% so that the fleet is completely electrified roughly from 2040 onwards. And this, the 2050 number there, you see that in the renewal case, it's all electric. And note also that there's a lower growth in the fleet size in that scenario than in the other scenarios because of much more efficient use of cars, much more public transportation that becomes an alternative, and also probably more car sharing. So we don't need as many cars, but the cars will drive more. I don't show the buses. They will be electrified to a large extent as well. And then we have the trucks, the rest of the heavy, heavy road transport. Much more efficient, more, uh, both the combustion engines, more efficient logistics. So we don't need as many trucks in that scenario. Quite a bit of electricity coming into the short haul trucking fleet as well, but still substantial oil left, oil demand left. And to the right, we have everything that is not on the road. And that's railroads, tube systems or, or, or metro systems, it's shipping and it's aviation. And in particular for shipping and aviation, just think about the underlying growth in demand for those services. We might fly three times as many kilometers in 2050 as today. Boeing was just out now saying that we need 42,000 new aircraft to satisfy demand by, tw by 2036. And then we have 15 more years before we get here. 240,000 new pilots, mainly to serve Asia. There's only a few things that grow by double-digit growth rates for many years, and one of them is the number of Chinese traveling internationally. It's grown by 17% on average since 2000. If that continues, we're going to have 8 to 10 billion movements of Chinese in the 40s, 2040s, and that's going to be flying. We assume we can do that, not 8 to 10 billion, but, the, but a fantastic growth in underlying air traffic. We can do that and use less oil. So an enormous improvement is necessary in the combustion engine efficiencies of airplanes. We do not think we're going to have large-scale electric flights by 2050. And also the same with shipping, much more efficient, much more gas. And all railroads in the world will have to be electrified. This is generally where a lot of people talking about the energy and climate transition, they stop. Once you've talked about electricity and you've talked about transport, you stop. But then you forget a very large part of remaining energy use, which is not transport and not electricity. We also forget a sizable part of oil demand, by the way. And that's this. Three other elements of energy use where we see transition. It will happen, but it will go slower, and it's more difficult. The industrial demand on the left, that's the energy use in all our manufacturing processes, delivering all the stuff we use. That is quite a bit of electricity already. It's quite a bit of coal. It's quite a bit of oil and gas. That will change going forward, become more efficient, more electric, and we'll have to take out some coal. And remaining coal in the cement and steel industry will probably have to be equipped with car some, some carbon capture and storage. But there will still be a lot of energy being used there. Some of these processes in manufacturing is difficult to electrify because of the, the, the necessary temperature. Also difficult to, to uh, electrify because of the need for baseload, high capacity type of electricity. In the middle, it's the energy use in residential sector houses and office buildings like this one. And just think about two and a half billion more people. That's 700 to one million to one billion new houses that have to be built and will use electricity, cooling and heating, being insulated, hopefully very energy efficient compared to what we have today. And we can think of a few houses in the world that also needs to be rebuilt. So we will have more electricity there, less coal, still have some gas, and we were, we're on the way to the two degree world in, the, in one of the scenarios, not the other ones. And just note, notice also that we in that sector, in the renewal scenario there, we are so efficient that we don't use more energy in the housing and, and building, building se office building sector, even though we have much more of it. That's also part of this. And just remember all the new million people cities that have to be built in Asia from now to 2050 to satisfy both housing and jobs. Finally, to the right, what is called non-energy demand. 
by IEA. It's the feedstock. It's oil and gas used in the petrochemical industry to produce the chairs you're sitting on, the wall-to-wall -wall carpets, your toothbrush, your car, your kitchen equipment, your clothes. That, ten that demand tends to follow GDP growth, at least to some extent. We might be a bit optimistic here. We just saw the IEA came out with their petrochemical uh, demand forecast, roughly the same story. They, they're slightly below us um, in terms of the growth. That's going to be a growth component, we think, for oil and gas at least, in all scenarios to 2050. Leads to more of a pollution problem in terms of plastics if we can't establish recycling mechanisms, etc. But a lot of this is not plastic and packaging. Most of this is other types of products where we used to fantastically efficient and a nice hydrocarbon molecule to produce different things. So that's the total. And then being an oil and gas company uh, and moving towards an energy company, we're, consi we're considering what happens to oil and gas demand across sectors and across scenarios. Well, this is the result of the previous charts. Focus on three things here. Uh, if you wonder whether oil demand from now to 2050, that's the left chart, goes up or down, you find the answer in transport sector. In the renewal scenario, we have such a massive electrification and energy efficiency assumptions that there's a lot of negative components, both in road transport and even in aviation and shipping, pulling oil demand significantly down when we get to 2050. In the other scenario, it's a bit back and forth. And the overall conclusion there is a, is a slight uh, or a relatively solid growth in oil demand. The second message, if you wonder about gas demand, whether that goes up or down, you find the answer in the electricity sector. It's the dark brown maroon segment there. In the renewal case, energy efficiency and a massive uh, decarbonization in the electricity sector leads to a significant reduction in demand for gas from the electricity sector. So that overall oil gas demand goes moderately down. In the other scenarios, the, uh, the, the, the impact of increased electrification is such that also gas demand goes up in that sector. Third message is that uh, there is a, there's a positive growth component across scenarios for both oil and gas, which is non-energy demand, the beige up there. So that's the feedstock demand continues to grow and, and it's a positive component. And then to the investment part, what's the need for investments? We believe, as I said, across scenarios in any kind of future, there's a massive need for investments in energy. And everybody nods when we talk about new renewables. Not everybody nods as much when we talk about oil investments, and that's why I start with that one. This is a really lousy forecast for oil demand from a chief economist the wide range there, right? My boss, of course, want, wants to know what's oil demand in 2050 going to be. Well, that depends on the scenario, right? On the one hand, it could be 60 million barrels per day. That's the renewal case. Or 120 in a robbery case. So, so when he saw that, he was reminded of Harry S. Truman, who said to ask for a one-armed chief economic advisor when he became president, because he was so tired of economists saying on one hand and on the other. Anyway. That's because the uncertainty is so large, right? But if you take a look at the two degree scenario renewal, we have 60 million barrels, 40% reduction in oil demand, caused by electrification and efficiency. If we were to stop today all activities in the oil and gas industry, except painting existing installations and maintaining them, so not using our brains to find out whether we should drill another well, not look for new oil, not invest in a platform on top of an existing resource to make it into a producible reserve that can deliver new oil. If we were to stop that, supply falls by somewhere between 3 and 6% globally every year. So it would fall in a gray range called the decline range. Because the characteristic of a hydrocarbon resource is that when you take one molecule out of the reservoir, it becomes less willing to give away the next one because the the pressure falls. And then if you accumulate all that, so the light blue plus the gray, if you have 6% decline, that's new oil that has to be delivered in a two-degree world from now to 2050. And that amounts to 480 billion barrels. Very few of us have an intimate relationship with a, a billion barrels, so, so, you know, and not to speak of 480. But is that a lot? Yes, it is. 
it's 30% more than the accumulated deliveries from OPEC over the last 35 years. So in a two degree world, we have to invest to ensure deliveries of new oil that could amount to 30% more over the next 35 years than, the OPEC, than OPEC actually has delivered over the last 35 years to satisfy demand. Difficult. This is gas. Same story. We have less of a range, and gas demand doesn't fall as much. Probably easier to pinpoint where all that new gas could come from. Not as much exploration needed, maybe. Not the same quality issues that we have with some of the new oils. But gas is much more difficult to make profitable for an oil company, because it has longer production times, it's more capital intensive, and the gas price per energy unit is lower than oil. So it's even more difficult to, sa to, to, to do these and satisfy the investors' uh, requirements for return. And we might need 71 trillion cubic meters, 71,000 billion cubic meters. We don't have an intimate relationship to that either, but th that is 60% more than the accumulated supply from the United States, Russia, Iran, Qatar, and the rest of the Middle East, that total over the last 35 years. Massive challenge. And just think about the investment climate around us today. Do we think that the industry will be able to do those types of investments? And then in addition comes the obvious one. In all scenarios, we will be investing a lot, and we have to, in new renewable electricity. The challenge there is, of course, uh, what will be the return of these investments for professional investors? What's the electricity price going to be when half of global electricity is produced by something that has a zero marginal cost of production? How do we ensure the regulation uh, satisfying companies' requirements for return, making sure that the electricity price doesn't go to zero? Last year, we had more than 100 hours in Germany with negative electricity prices. 13% of the hours last year in Germany, 1,100 hours, we had electricity prices that were below the marginal cost of a gas-fired or a coal-fired or a nuclear power plant, we'd lose money. That's one issue. We think that this capacity growth will be positive and be larger and larger, both in the reform and in the rural scenario, every year to 2050. One of the challenges that people do not talk a lot about is that as this industry becomes bigger and older, a large part of the capacity increase will be to replace old windmills and solar panels. We think they live for 20 years, economically, 20, 25 years. Here we've assumed 20 years. So that by 2050, in a renewal scenario, we have to invest twice as much as we did in the record year last year just to replace existing capacity and then add on new. This will be a large part, or at least a visible part, of global steel production capacity, global cement production capacity et cetera, et cetera, depending on the development in these types of technologies. Another part of this picture is the necessary increase in supply capacity of batteries. And here we are, uh, we don't dare to model that very much in detail, but we've done just to 2030 and looked at our assumptions for cars in particular. And by 2030, 12 years from now, the world has to be able to deliver 35 times more car batteries than we do today. That means 35 times more lithium mining, cobalt mining, railroad transport out of the mines to the coastline in Chile, if you're in Bolivia as an example, and then battery production capacity. The reason why we have to wait months for electric vehicles in Norway now is not the car, but it's the battery delivery capacity. The waiting time for an electric vehicle in Norway is much longer than for a normal combustion engine car. Now, and that's there. So that we do think the resources are there, there's enough lithium, there's probably enough cobalt, and if there isn't, we'll find something else probably. But the, the, the capacity of the industry to expand the supply capacity is a challenge. M massive investments. And just towards the end, finally, how do our scenarios compare to others? This is a really messy chart. And the good thing about not having one but three very different forecasts is basically that we span out what others are saying. Uh, I should have. If I had known, I would have put in the MIT scenario that came out just before the weekend as well, but I haven't. But we compare here to the three IEA scenarios, the new policy, the sustainable development, and the current policy scenario, uh, the ExxonMobil, the BP, and then a Norwegian supplier um, that 
DNVGL that delivers a fantastic piece of work as well. Um, one message basically <coughs> is that at least we cannot be accused of being overly optimistic on the role of gas in a two degree scenario. If you look at the right chart there, you see that our renewal scenario has a very conservative gas demand forecast com compared to others. That's one message. We're, in the rivalry case, we're probably on the high side in terms of oil demand. Uh, one of the things that we'll look at into for, for next year, etc. But generally span out. And then on the electricity differences, we're in the middle of the pack, both in terms of change in electricity generation and the share of that that will come from re new renewables. There are some crazy outliers, if you like, here. It's the, the Norwegian DNVGL. Look at the electricity generation and the share of solar and wind there, 70% solar and wind. And you have the Shell Sky scenario, which assumes an enormous amount of electrification. But generally, we're in, in the middle of, middle of the pack and relatively comfortable that we have. We've, made an outcome space with these three scenarios that we are fairly certain, not fairly certain, we're fairly comfortable that the actual development for key, key energy carriers will fall somewhere in between there. But if we all want the renewal scenario, and not to speak of the, an even tougher one in terms of emission reductions, just it should be relatively clear here that uh, there's an urgent need for action stop talking about these scenarios and start doing something if we are going to have any hope of reaching them. It's possible, but it's an enormous challenge. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, and thanks. Um, I come away with a, a slight pessimism, which is kind of tough in this town to deliver something that makes us more pessimistic than, <laughs> than we already are. So, so, so thank you for that. Um, sorry, sorry about that. I mean, you know, by tomorrow there'll be something else. So um, I wanted to maybe start off the conversation to bring uh, sort of Equinor back into the picture. So, you know, as a company that is investing, you know, billions of dollars in energy supply uh, in the energy system, you know, how do you, what is the takeaway from this outlook about what you are doing, what you should be doing? And in particular, if I can add in there, sort of the, you know, the IPCC report, in a way saying that renewal looks tough, that's not enough, we should be thinking even more. You know, how do you, how do you process all that information in terms of thinking about you know, what a company should be doing? Mm. Well, I think, I think on a company level, I guess the, the type of discussions that we have um, is that uh, we're relatively clear that there is, uh, there is a need for and there is room for us taking part in investing both in new oil and gas and in new renewables, irrespective of scenario. Um, even in the rivalry scenario, some regions of the world will probably have the same type of climate policy very close to the, at least what they would have in the renewal scenario and thereby promoting renewable electricity, for instance, in Europe. Uh, so so the, for any given company, there's a lot of opportunities here. The type of discussion we have also is that uh, increasingly we are seeing that uh, when we make these investment decisions, we have a, a different dialogue about how robust would they be in different outcomes than we used to. So that's, the, that's the good, one of the good aspects of having these types of scenarios, that the, it, it provides a different type of corporate discussion and more of a wind tunneling of, of strategies, if you like, right? So, so, so our strategy, where, which is to, you know, to grow significantly in new renewables, to continue to deliver more energy efficient and thereby lower carbon um, oil and gas, is geared to be robust against these. And then, of course, and we think we have some competitive advantages in a, in a, both in the renewable space, but also in a renewal scenario, because we have, we're used to very high carbon taxation, as an example. Right? So, so there are, and, and we think we can do offshore wind better than many others, and then we'll see how that plays out. So, so that's, um, that's sort of on the, on, on the internal arena. Um, regarding this discussion about, the discussion about uh, what is enough, uh, the, uh, it's just more of the same that is needed, right? I mean, so, so, uh, I mean the, the one thing that I worry about is that if we spend too much time discussing the finer details of one and a half or 1.6 or two or two and a half, uh, we risk that the best becomes the enemy of the good. 
Because if you look at all these scenarios, there's no, there no silver bullet. We have to do a lot of these things to bring the world forward in a sustainable way, becoming as energy efficient as possible, uh, growing re renewables a lot, have, becoming more efficient, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of our transport sector, irrespective of what we think about the outcome of the CO2 concentration and thereby temperature. So that, so instead of spending a lot of, uh, whether the renewal scenario here is aggressive or enough, is sort of beside the point. I mean, it's enormously challenging. And, and it will be absolutely impossible to achieve this if we wait 10 years before we do something. So we have to start changing framework conditions and doing that in a way where we learn things uh, along the way, irrespective of whether the, the ultimate outcome is one and a half or two. Once we have figured, as an example, once we have figured out how to do carbon capture and storage, which we have to, and we, that has to be pushed by a significant increase pr primarily in the carbon price, then we possibly can speed up that process if that turns out to be necessary to reduce emissions even more. Um, and in the same way, I mean, once we have started to do something in terms of electrification, it can probably speed up, but we have to start doing it. And, and, uh, and wasting a lot of intellectual resources on, on uh, talking about the sort of the finer details of one and a half versus two is a waste of time, basically. The, the problem now is, of course, that we're, we're so far away from targets being followed by measures that, that we're heading for something that is not two and a half, it's three and a half. And then, uh, then we better start doing something to get it down. I mean, two and a half is better than three, two is better than two in terms of consequences, et cetera, et cetera. So let me do a follow-up on that, because when you presented your scenarios, it, it was very clear that renewal is sort of policy-driven, that it requires sort of active um, guidance and intervention. Um, and so I, I was wondering if you could share a little bit, you know, what does that policy look like? And also, you know, I think there is a part of the conversation in this space that says, well, you know, in about 10 years, maybe batteries you know, will be competitive and therefore maybe we shouldn't do much more. Or, you know, wind has become a lot more competitive. Maybe we should stop thinking about that. So how do you think about sort of the role of policy? What type of policy are we talking about? What scope? And also, you know, is there a point at which the market itself, the technology has matured enough that you can sort of take your foot off the accelerator? Or is it sort of a continuous policy agenda? Well, I think to, to, to a large extent, it will have to be a continuous policy agenda. The, the main point that we make, we think, is that in order to, to kickstart a, a relatively fast development towards lower emission intensities and, and higher energy efficiency, uh, you would have relatively, we need relatively rapid changes in, in policies first, also to help the technology development, to help the markets. Um, and things like, um, I mean, it's a big paradox that if we're concerned with climate, the one thing that, that many countries in Europe have agreed to is to phase out nuclear quickly. And that's a bit of a paradox, right? I mean, I, nuclear is, has its problems and it's expensive and it, to some extent it's extremely old, so it will have to be phased out anyway. Uh, but but uh, that it's so difficult to phase out coal in Germany is a big paradox if you're concerned with climate. So, but it, but it, so and what does it have to do? It has to do with further tightening of fuel efficiency standard for car fleets, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we see now that they will ha the car producers will have to deliver electric vehicles to satisfy the standards, to force that even more. It's about putting a price on carbon. I mean, that's the main thing. And, and that's, that's um, a combination of, of, uh, of quota systems or trading schemes, uh, tax, et cetera. I mean, once, once, uh, once you establish a domestic price on carbon that works, uh, you immediately will be faced with what do I do at the border? So it's, uh, so which is, and that hasn't happened yet, right? I mean, the EU has established a trading system that hasn't worked until now, because the price is now coming up. Now they will be starting to discuss, you know, what about carbon leakage? What should we do on the border? Should we have a car? And, and then there's no quota system, then you need a tax. So, so, so that's uh, one of the things to, that, that will have to come. It's, uh, it's uh, subsidizing re general research, probably not picking technologies, but, uh, but there's something we still need research on this one, both whether it's carbon capture and storage or more efficient development of renewable electricity, et cetera, et cetera, for a while. One of the things that have to come in, in place is, uh, is uh, regulatory regimes that makes it relatively certain for professional investors that will actually have a price on electricity. 
going forward. I mean, that's one of the worries, is that the electricity price will be too low. Then you can't invest, because it's still relatively capital intensive. So it's those types of things. And then, of course, you will be helped by technology. And there's a lot of things that we don't know that we, I mean, and we will, can be helped. But it's putting in place a sort of a climate for development that goes in the right direction. And there we are very far away from being in the right place at the moment. You talked about the ETS in Europe, and you, and you talked also about sort of carbon leakage. And, and I wanted to go, in your one of your initial charts, you showed sort of the relation between economic growth and energy consumption. And, you know, there's a couple of ways to look at that. One is to say, if we want to meet this target, we need to be able to get to the same GDP with much less energy. But another way to look at it is to say, we can get to the same GDP with a lot less energy. And what I found interesting is the highest GDP of all is the renewal in 2050, yeah. eventually. Yeah. But you sort of pay a price up front. Is that how you think about it? And is that more or less what that scenario is describing, that you kind of have to sacrifice a little bit up front to get benefits further back? Or is that not the way I should be reading that? No, but, but that is true, part of it. We think that the, that the nest, I mean, to, spe to speed up the transition, uh, we have to do things where, where, first of all, the economic return of what we do are, is not known. Um, for a period, we probably will have to shut down perfectly operating the relatively modern coal-fired power plants, as an example. Replace it by something else. That's a loss of value for a period. It's a loss of value for someone. So that's going to cost something. But then we think as markets start functioning better, we take away all the fossil fuel subsidies. I didn't mention that, but that has to go away anyway. Um, you get a better working of the economy, and therefore you get a slightly higher growth rate in a renewal scenario gradually than in a reform case. What we've also done here is that since neither reform nor rivalry deliver on, on climate targets, you get an increasing cost of climate change that, that becomes a drag on GDP in those two scenarios as we approach 2050. And of course, if we, if we had taken that further out, the, the difference between renewal and reform would be bigger also because of the climate cost impact. So that's how we have been thinking about that. And here we. I think a lot of people disagree with us in terms of that this transition will actually cost something for a period, but that's... Uh... Um, I know it's always terrible to ask, you know, when you have three scenarios, I don't want to ask about probabilities, but I, I wanted to ask about your rivalry scenario is really driven by geopolitical tension. And I guess the question is, relative to what we have now, what tension are we talking about? Is it, you know, much more? Is it, are we not necessarily going towards the amount of tension that you're imagining, but are we talking about something a lot more, or is it the amount of tension that you see on the trade side? And you know, one example in you know, Norway's backyard, big customer, you know, Brexit, and, and those type of, 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 of geopolitical events, you know, sanctions, you talked about the Middle East. I mean, if I were to ask it simply, the amount of tension that we have, how much how far away is it from your rivalry tension in your head? No, I, to be honest, I think if you look at the geopolitical situation at the moment and also some of the regional issues that we're facing and the discussions about, and the, uns the uncertainty caused by an event like Brexit, uh, we are at the moment in that dimension very close to what we're describing in the rivalry scenario. You don't, you don't have to make that much worse. Uh, I mean, to, to, to have that development. And CO2 emissions are rising, right? at the moment, as an example. What, what is, of course, di what is difficult with that scenario when you model it, is, we have modeled it, also, uh, some people probably notice that it goes up and down, right? There's a, we have a, we try to model a cyclical economic development, so you have periods of recession and, and pick up. Uh, and of course, that's extremely difficult to do. Uh, but this is not a war scenario. Uh, but it is a scenario where you, you could easily foresee, I mean, IMF and OECD now took down their, their growth assumptions for for 2019 and 2020 by 0.2 percentage points due to the impact of protectionism. Well, slightly tougher protectionism than that, then you're down to the growth rates that we have in rivalry scenario. So maybe we're, it's a scenario that looks like today, but with a slightly tougher type of protectionist stance than we in general see sanctions and so on. But we're not able to model this in detail per sector or per country, but, uh, but it's, a, it's a story that we, we think we, if, if we're analytically honest, we should not uh, we should not uh, leave that scenario aside because it, is, uh, it does describe some tendencies that we see. You know, I think it, one of the interesting questions that I was sort of grappling with when I, was, when I was looking at this is, you know, 
the question, the extent to which renewal has to be collaborative. Um, mm. And if you, if you think about you know, the progress that China has made, it's mostly for Chinese reasons, I would mm. say. Uh, the United States is sort of very proud that despite not really caring about Kyoto and things like that, its emissions have looked really good. Um, I mean, is there a case that rivalry actually, I mean, if you think about most of the wonderful things that we have, uh, you might be able to trace them back to either war or paranoia about mm -hmm. war. Um, and so is there a case where you might actually, despite geopolitical tension, get a lot more sort of investment, national security driven into new things and, and you get more change that, that we may, uh, that, that your scenario might suggest? Yes. There is. You can make a you can make a robbery scenario, which is uh, which is greener, if you like, uh, than than what we have uh, to some extent. You could I mean, and then you you put in a war type economy, economic assumption, and you uh, if countries decide to go much more independent in their energy sources because of security supply concerns, etc. You could to some extent where you where you struggle where you would struggle then is first of all that. Not, have, not having sufficiently high GDP growth reduces the ability to do the technological change that is necessary here, to both on the subsidy side, the, I mean, the, the government revenues, where, where would the taxation come from, et cetera, et cetera, to drive that type of change, that's one, one thing. Uh, the other thing is that where this is most, if, if you look at the size of the challenge, both in terms of satisfying demand um, and, and uh, the fact that where, or where the, all the energy poverty in the world is, um, it's in the areas of the world where they, the indigenous resource, they have ample amounts of our coal. So, so, so in, a, in a war type economy, what, is, what would stop India from using its own coal resources in, such a, in a world where they don't trust the Russians or the Central Asian republics or Australia to deliver the gas, right? That is necessary. But on the renewable side, you could, you could get more renewables, but you, can go, you, you will stop at some point, we think. But uh, you can definitely make it, a rivalry scenario that is greener in some countries, at least, or in some regions, than what we have made. Um, I'm going to ask a final one, and then I'm going to come to you, so get, get your question all refined. Um, there's a lot of numbers and forecasts and, and assumptions here. If I were to ask you to give us the extreme of very high confidence, very low confidence, what would those be? The things that you're pretty sure, I mean, you talked about some implicit assumptions that we all agree. Mm. Uh, but what are the numbers that you think, you know, you feel really good about? And what are the things that, you know, this thing could be off by a factor of two or three or five, and it wouldn't really surprise you? I mean, are there things like that in, that you've sort of grappled with? Yeah, I think I, we're fairly sure that oil demand will peak within the next 10, 12 years. And we've had, in our reform scenario, we've had peak oil demand now for the last five, six editions of this report. Um, we're extremely uncertain whether it will happen in 2022, which is the renewal scenario, right? But, uh, but at least within the next 10, 15 years, we are fairly certain that that will peak. Um, we're fairly certain that gas demand will have, gas will have an important role to play irrespective of scenarios. Uh, difficult to see a, a massive decrease in gas demand. That's why that is relatively stable, and we're actually relatively conservative. When you look at some of the potential, both the potential, the, uh, I mean, tweaking the growth rate of renewables from an average of 8% per year for 35 years to 10% per year for 35 years makes a massive difference. And of course, we're extremely uncertain about that exact growth rate, right? I mean, we. So, so those are the, some, some of the things. That, but aircraft or demand for air traffic in 2050, if you look on the demand side, some of the, some of the factors there are extremely uncertain as well and can go in all kinds of directions. There's, there's a number of black swans out there that we haven't modeled, both on the technology side but also on the demand side. So, but um, yeah, it's, um, that's why we make scenarios. <laughs> take Fantastic. Take. Uh, okay. Let's come to the audience. Uh, very simple rules. Wait for the mic. State your name and your question in the form of a uh, question. Uh, Jamie. If you can keep your hand up so that they know where to bring the mic. Thank you. 
thank you, uh, Eric. That was uh, fantastic. Your second assumption was that the world is undergoing an energy transition, but then you immediately cautioned it and said that it was not going fast enough and it was too narrow. And you said that the two places where it's going is EVs and renewables. Now I know what faster looks like, but in terms of it being less narrow, and you said it needed to happen in a bunch of different uh, sectors, where would you see, so if we talk in a couple of years, it's EVs, it's renewables, and it's, what is your third, third kind of sector that you would say is mm -hmm. most likely to be that next sector? Is it, is it petrochemicals and plastics, or, or where, where else do you see that? coming up um, hopefully in the next couple of years. Thanks. Yeah, no, no I, th I think on, on the sectoral side, it, I mean, it's uh, the next step would be to expand the transition to more countries than where we see it now, or to, or to basically where, where you can see it is in, a, is in a couple of suburbs in Oslo, basically, in terms, of, uh, <laughs> in terms of EV penetration. We passed, by the way, Norway passed now 50% new car sales being electric slash plug-ins. So past 60 actually in September. Um, but in terms of sect sec so, so expanding renewables and, exp uh, and, and expanding EV penetration to other countries um, is, is the, the next step. Then on the sectoral side, my hunch is to, that we will, uh, the most likely place we'll see more of it would be in, in heavy duty transport. So moving to the heavier part of, tran of road transport. That's the most. Uh, that's the next next one, and then of course it's a matter of, of uh, how far can you go. There was a comment by. Uh, I, I don't adhere to this, but there was a com when Tesla uh, presented its truck. There was a comment by uh, by a central guy in in this the biggest uh, Swedish uh, truck producer saying that this truck is fantastic to transport potato chips. Because the challenge, of course, with trucking is that the ba when the batteries are heavy, how much load, payload, can you put in the truck before it? So, so, there was, so he said it was, you know, potato chips doesn't weigh a lot, right? So, but, that, but that's the next one. It's the bus sector. It's the, f it's the f uh, and the reason is also that that's where you have the, f the fleet possibilities, where you can have centralized charging and so on, right? You can have lo logistical. So that's the, I think that's the, the next one. Um, and then we're, uh, then we're struggling with, uh, with, uh, manufacturing and, and um, the building sector, which will be slower, we think. And where it's possible, but I, I mean, you have, if, when you have a gas-fired, uh, or gas-based cooling and heating system, particularly heating, like we have in Europe, of course, one of the extra challenges of electrifying that is that you, you need, you have, we have the grid of, of gas pipelines, we have a grid of electricity lines that might not be geared to take much more electricity, so you have to rebuild an electricity grid, and you have a perfectly functioning gas grid, uh, and then electrifying also would then require much more windmills and solar panels, right? So that's one of the reasons why it will be, that we think that will be slower. Okay. Uh, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, Nikos, thank you. And, and Eric, thank you for the uh, presentation. Mark Finley with BP. Uh, you kept made a passing reference to zero and negative power prices as zero marginal cost renewables scale up. And I guess my question is, can you help me think through the ramifications of that? I mean, how do you run a power market or invest for the future with no price of power? Uh, what are the ramifications of that? Is it something to worry about? And if so, what's to be done about it? Mm. Yeah, it is definitely something to worry about. And it's something that we don't talk a lot about. I mean, because you have very different, uh, very different incentives. If you're a German household, you have Europe's highest electricity prices as a consumer. And the incentive to put a solar panel on your ceiling is enormous because you reduce your cost, right? And then you can also become a prosumer. You deliver electricity to the grid when you produce too much. But if you're a professional investor, a utility or an energy company like us, you have to look at the wholesale price of electricity. And this is, fundam this is fundamentally a sector, fundamentally a, te a technology where you have um, zero marginal cost, more or less. So you have falling average cost. It's relatively capital intensive, much more capital intensive than a, than a gas-fired power plant. And then the tendency of the price going to zero is something you have to regulate. Well, and it's the same thing in, a, in, a, in an electricity grid where we have systems. So, and that today, all new electricity in renewables, where it generally happens, new renewables in, in, in where it generally happens, it's in Europe. Uh, it's coming here now as well has been based on either a guaranteed price, the subsidy element, a PPA type of contract, 
or a bet that there will always be a gas-fired or coal-fired power plant producing and setting the price for you when you produce. And then you can hope to make a margin. But in a system where, you have where we have 50 up to 50% electricity produced by these types of sources, that bet is less likely to come through. And then we need feed-in tariffs or we need uh, capacity uh, subsidies. So you're paid to keep capacity or whatever. And that, those types of, it's probably, it, it's possible to do it, but it's something that could slow down the process because we haven't figured out how to do it yet. And when, the, when a country like Germany has a situation where, where the price is significantly negative for some hours during the year, up to more than, more than 100 last year, we have to pay to get rid of electricity. And they pay their neighboring countries to get rid of electricity. Then it's an illustration of some of the regulatory issues. And most of the growth in electricity will take place in, in countries and areas of the world where we do not have a long tradition of, of modern regulation. And it's also one of the difficult issues here. So I don't have the answer to it, but, it, but there's something that has to be done in the same way as regulating uh, infrastructure, pipelines and grids, and which, which we also do, but, but not perfectly. And the risk, the ramification of not doing it is that uh, the companies and actors that are, would be in a position to make these bets, uh, to finance these large scale investments will be more hesitant to do it. And then the growth will be slower. If I can do a follow up on that, I think, you know, the IEA shows a lot about how the capacity is being built and how much of that is based on sort of government guarantees of some sort. And, you know, it sort of begs the question, since the demand is coming from sort of emerging economies, whether we're really going to see more open competitive electricity markets or whether countries are going to decide that, you know what, at the end of the day, we really need a very heavy government hand, heavy regulation. And yes, you may have private investment, but you're not going to try to replicate the amount of you know, openness and competitiveness that you have in the West. I think that's one of the questions that at least I've been mm. struggling with, because at the end of the day, you know, once you add enough regulation, you're not really that far away from essentially a, a decreed market, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's one of the one. And I, but this is probably a market where free, comp or sort of free competition won't deliver. So we need it. And also the amount of openness. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, countries here cannot live in perfect is isolation. And uh, because if, if we were to go, especially in a small region, like, but you think about the states in the U.S. as well. I mean, you have to trade with electricity. You have to transport the sun from Arizona to Washington State sometimes, right, if you go with all renewables. And, and, and the same thing in Europe. We, large, large capacities, all our panel, uh, panels in, in, or plants in Spain will serve Germany with electricity when it rains there, and it often rains in Germany. And we don't have the grid line. So we need at least international markets, international open markets for trading electricity. But it has to be in some kind of regulatory regime that works because, uh, because free competition won't deliver. Uh, up here, up in the front. Thank you. I'm Mitzi Wertheim with the Naval Postgraduate School, but my interest in energy started when <clears throat> in 04 I got a phone call from a retired uh, Navy submariner asking me to have, to get a conversation of energy going here in the U.S. And we in fact got it started at the Defense Department, got the line in Bush's State of the Union, the nation has a problem, we're addicted to oil, and we became I was intrigued by your discussion in trying to figure out the social consequences of these changes that are needed and thinking of all the poor people who do have cars, but the likelihood of them being able to get electric cars has to be long in the future. So it me the societal consequences of these changes are enormous, and I don't know how you've thought about that. Thank you. You're right. Uh, but, and it goes, goes in many, many different directions. Uh, uh, when we discuss uh, sustainability and climate, we tend to forget the other parts of sustain the sustainable development goals associated with energy, which is to secure everybody affordable and reliable energy. So that's one part of it, no, not solving the, 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 the need for energy, poor people to get access to energy. Uh, that is also sustainable. Uh, get people out of biomass and and into electricity, as an example. And the same thing with, with the, one of the reasons why 
some of these changes are so challenging to make, to, to, to make happen sufficiently quickly is, of course, that the things like, I mean, the, the capital lives of any kind of energy using capital equipment is long, the, the, the economic life. So, so once you bought a car, you're going to keep it for a while. And once you've built the coal-fired power plant, that's going to be running for a while. And that's one of the changes that is difficult. And increasingly, we see now protests against the distributional consequences of climate policies that could actually work. Uh, in Europe now, we see increasing protests, uh, even in Norway, against uh, road pricing schemes, toll roads. And the protests come from the relatively poor or the ones that have a difficulty to adapt. You need your car to bring your kids to kindergarten and school. You have to go through these toll, tolls uh, every time. In Singapore now, they, they, which has a fantastic uh, road congestion pricing system, it's called ERP. The people there call it every day, rob the people. Uh, uh, so increasingly, we have to think about this uh, because the, the, the dis and, and, and on a global scale, the distributional consequences of the necessary changes here is to take a lot of money out of the resource-rich nations in the Middle East, reduce the, reduce the producer prices of oil and gas, and transfer that to the net importers, being in China or elsewhere. So also, that, how, how to make that acceptable. And it's the same thing also that within each country, who are the losers of these types of changes? And the fundamental challenge is, of course, that if we do not get a change in consumer behavior through the polluter, and, and that has to happen through a polluter pay, a pay approach, then we, can, then we won't reach it. So how do you compensate the losers in a polluter pay type of regime is, is increasingly com becoming difficult. And uh, take, take away the fossil fuel subsidies in Venezuela and see what happens. Uh, if I can ask a follow-up to that then, your renewal scenario, you've defined it as sort of a two degree. You know, the IA now has switched from sort of 450 PPM to a sustainable development that includes access mm -hmm. and electrification. What are the assumptions around that? Because if I remember correctly, there's still a lot of sort of primary biomass even in that, um, mm. in that renewal scenario. So how far does it get us uh, towards sort of the broader sustainable development goals? Well, we don't have a modeling apparatus that, that is uh, similar to IEAs in terms of making sure that everybody has access to electricity in, in our scenarios. But, but generally speaking, our renewal scenario would be very similar to the SDS scenario that they have. Uh, the biomass that we have there, I mean, b by definition, it's going to be a very different biomass in 2050 than the one we have today. So it has to be a more clean, it has to be a cleaner one, it has to be a more large scale waste type of management instead of burning wood in your home, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, but we don't have the modeling apparatus, but by, by nature, that's, I mean, that's the tradition. That's, that's where it's going. Yeah. And of course, one of the challenges here is that if we're not able to make that, uh, the tendency of a country like India, for instance, to move out of biomass and replace that with coal-generated electricity, like China did in the 70s and 80s, uh, would be stronger. So, it's, uh, so that's also, um, which is why we should hope that India jumps to a lot of renewable electricity, that they first get gas that they can suppl supplement that with, et cetera, et cetera. Let's go in the back there. And, uh, yes. Uh, yes, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of Emerald Planet, Emerald Planet TV. Looking at the shared economy, it's just like in this town of Washington, D.C., we have now almost 40% of the people that have no cars. And they're using, you know, the Uberization of, of the transportation system, uh, even though the mass transportation has declined over the last five years because of this safe track and renewals, that's probably going to go back up. So what do you, what, does that fit into your scenario of a shared economy? Because whether you go to Dubai or you go to Dar es Salaam, you find Ubers and, you know, that type of uh, sort of shared economy, you know, spreading at a very rapid rate. So you have less cars possibly, and uh, you have uh, more concentration of where, you know, the people on the margins, as this lady was asking here, have access to transportation at a cheaper price, but it's, uh, it's on-demand availability. How does that fit into your scenario? No, that, thank you uh, for being here. That, that, story, I mean, that story fits very well into the, some of the assumptions that we have in the renewal scenario. If you notice that we, ha we have a much slower growth in the global car fleet in that scenario than in the others. 
And the reason is that you have more, one of the reasons is that you have more sharing of cars. It doesn't mean that the, the energy use necessarily go down if that car drives much, or, much more often. If, if every car drove as much as a taxi, we would use much more energy, right? So it's, a, so it's a, whether it's, whether that is a solution to go to the renewal scenario depends on the consequences of the overall energy use. And, and a few, but some people think in, a, in BP's energy outlook, they made a point that they think that the electric vehicles are better suited to a world where you have more car fleets that are used in a sharing economy because of the potential for charging and, and so on. So if that happens, you also have an association with it. You have more, more sharing and then you have more electricity as well. And that's good news for emissions. But yes, it's, you can have much more sharing with much more digital solutions. Uh, we'll also use all, all these electric vehicles will be used as uh, balancing, balancing batteries for inter daily intermittency in, in uh, the electricity sector because they will all be plugged in when they don't drive, etc. But then you can't use them as an Uber all the time, so, uh, because then it's always driving. So we'll see a lot of that. And, uh, but the, but the, key, the key issue is that um, um, you ha we, have to, we have to find solutions where the lifestyle of modern middle class consumers is not the replica of the lifestyle in Washington DC, Houston, Atlanta, Los Angeles, or Oslo, or Stavanger, where I come from. Because we, we basically, we, we use too much energy moving each other around. Uh, we have public transportation systems that don't work and we depend too much on, on one or two people in a car. So, so the future cities in Asia will have to find solutions. If, if we're going to get there, we, we will have, if you compare Barcelona and Atlanta, two cities that are roughly equal, the, the Cameron Commission some years back uh, made that comparison. And the energy use per capita in Barcelona is one-fifth of what it is in Atlanta. So it's the Barcelona model that will have to be transformed into all the new mil million people cities in, in, in Asia. So it's the combination of the way we move, shared vehicles, more energy efficient solutions, public transportation systems, et cetera. Well, I'm not an expert on that, except that, but the point they made is that it's an extremely compact city relative to a city like Atlanta or Houston, right? So, so the, the need to move people over long distances is much lower. And they have a public transportation system that works, so you don't need a car. You, you, you go into the tube. Uh, they have an airport that is 15 minutes away from the center of the city. So, so, so that, at least that's the small apartments, not big houses. Nobody, which one of the consequences is that nobody has this Californian dream of an enormous solar panel on the roof and a couple of Teslas in the garage and a battery, right? And that's because there's not enough room for that. So it's, it's compact cities and, and probably that's the way we have to go. Um, we're getting towards the lightning round part of the evening. So we're going to do three questions at a time. That's one, two, and three in the back. So George, if you want to start with Jan here. <coughs> All right, I'm Jan Maris, Resources for the Future. Did you use a carbon price in your renewal scenario? And if not, what is the carbon price that you would expect in 2050 in that? Thank you. Right next to you, Lee. Yeah. Um, Lee Beck, Global CCS Institute. Could you elaborate on um, your assumption for carbon capture and storage delivering emissions cuts and how, what your assumptions about technology, development, deployment, and transfer are? Super, we're getting some momentum. No? Uh, so we have a third person that okay. wanted to. Let's go over there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah hi, Bill Eichert, uh, consultant. Could you um, elaborate a little bit more on battery technology, what you see for improvement in technology, but also the economic cycle of it? Because I think it's integral to the renewable scenario. Super. Carbon price, carbon capture and sequestration, battery. Carbon price in renewal, yes, we have it, and we have a rapid increase. Uh, when you get towards uh, well, 2040 to 2050, we have a carbon price in the area of 100 to 150 dollars per ton, more or less globally. It doesn't matter what Norway does, but, but the large, all the large regions. Well, you know, so that's a, a part of that is then to stimulate the necessary carbon capture and storage. It's the only source of income in a carbon capture and storage project. Uh, we in our we are because we are so. Uh, aggressive or optimistic, if you like, on energy intensity improvement and decarbonization of the electricity sector, we do not need as much carbon capture and storage to reach the two degree trajectory of emissions as, for instance, IEA or Shell in their sky scenario. 
so we have one and a half billion tons of carbon capture and storage in the renewable scenario in 2050 in annual, and it's of course going to increase. It's mainly on the remaining cement and steel type of production, if you like, because we do not have a lot of coal fire. We have a little bit in the, in the power sector, but not that much. One and a half billion tons then sounds little compared to the four billion tons that Shell has in their um, sky scenario. But it's an enormous amount of carbon capture. It's one of the challenges. Uh, it's twice as much mass of CO2 as we produce in wheat globally every year now. We produce 750 million tons of wheat. And just Im imagine the industrial endeavor associated with that, you know, producing it in Ukraine and Russia and Dakotas and Iowa and Nebraska, moving it to the global markets, etc. Well, this is CO2. It's the same thing, except that it's take it out of a pipe, uh, exhaust pipe, you pressurize it, you transport it, put it in the storage. So in, uh, one and a half billion tons is enormous. And the development now is nowhere close to making that a realistic assumption, something that is probable. And just imagine if you have to go to four billion tons. So that's on the car. And we need technology development there. And unless we, unless we have higher carbon prices, it will be very slow. And also, we don't know where we can store all, it, all of it, right, as well. So it's, that's part of the equ equation here. And it's how can we transport it. On the battery technology, uh, we have assumed a gradual, continued development of efficiency, but there's a limit as to how much you can do that until you have to change to other materials or you have to go liquid, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So, but, so it's, it, but it's part of the general efficiency assumptions that we have. That doesn't mean it's easy or given. It's a, it's a big uncertainty, both in terms of how far down can you get the weight and the volume, and, uh, and also uh, the, the, the volume or the mineral requirements, and where are they going to come from. So, but, but it's a relatively heroic assumption then that we will have these minerals. If we don't have them, we'll find something else, and then we'll have to start again at, at the less efficient level. If we start using sulfur as an example for a source of battery, we'll have to come down another learning curve. So it's, uh, but uh, that's, that's a, it's an important piece of research to find out where these minerals are going to come from and, and how we can make that an, uh, also an industry, if you like, because we need an industry of batteries here. Okay, uh, last question or two if you have it. If not, uh, we're right up against our time. So I just really want to thank you. This was fantastic. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. So please, please thank, thank Eric for us. Good questions. <laughs>